folks. This video is explaining a circular motion lab that we have in class. Uh, the lab apparatus looks like this. It's just a piece of PVC pipe with a string running through it, and then there's a cork tied to one end. And the basic gist of this is the cork goes around in a circle, and so we're going to swing it around. Ugh, don't bonk your head with it. That is a major safety concern. Swing around like this and try and get in, uh, in frame here. Right? So it goes around in a circle. Now you notice that, uh, that I have to hold the string down that's to provide tension, because tension is going to be the force that's causing this thing to go around in a circle. That's our force in the centripetal direction. So in your analysis uh, for this lab, you're going to be looking at that, that rule about centripetal acceleration being equal to the net force toward the center of the circle. Here, that's tension, divided by the mass of the object. That'd be the, the cork going around. Uh, so you're going to need to be able to make some measurements then of uh, that force and of the centripetal acceleration. Now, force is pretty straightforward. We have uh, these devices, which are force sensors that attach to our Explorer probes. Um, and so we have the, the hook on the end, and you can pull on the hook or you can push on the hook, and those will measure the force. So I'm just going to attach the, the force sensor to the end of my string. And rather than holding on to the string directly, I'll just hold on to the force sensor. And we get this thing spinning around again. Now when I uh, measure the, the uh, when I have my Explorer probe turned on, it'll measure the force. Now, we, we will want to keep a couple of things consistent here. We're trying to verify that this rule works, so we need to have good measurements for, uh, for force. Uh, so we need that to stay consistent. Now you can twirl this thing really fast, you can twirl it really slowly. Uh, don't go too slow because you bonk your head like I just did, uh, but you can twirl it at different speeds and that's going to require different amounts of force. So we want to try and keep that as consistent as possible. The other thing that we need to do with this is uh, make sure that our, our speed and our radius for that circle uh, remain constant. And that can be a little bit trickier on this. Uh, one way to, to keep the radius consistent would be to tie a knot in the string. Then the radius couldn't change, the string wouldn't move. But if we tie a knot in the string, we're not using the force sensor to apply that, that tension force, to cause that tension force. And so we don't have any idea how big that force is there. We can't measure it if we tie a knot or hold the string in place with, uh, you know, with a, a thumb across the thing, something like that. Uh, so that's not going to be an option. We need a different way to keep the, the length consistent. Um, one way that uh, you can do this is just by holding everything on, on a meter stick. So you might want to just kind of grab both the meter stick and the, the pipe with one hand, and then with your other hand, get my force sensor back on here. It's kind of a lot to hold on to all at once, so use your teammates to help get this set up. The other hand will loop the force sensor on here, and then I can just hold this against the, the meter stick at some position. So get that at 30 centimeters, and it looks like the top of my, uh, my pipe is right at the zero mark. So I can measure how much string is, is going to be left, um, other than the 30 centimeters I have used up between my two hands. And then as long as I hold on to the, the meter stick tightly, as I swing this thing around, that distance isn't going to change. So I have a consistent uh, radius for my arc. Now maintaining a constant speed is a little bit trickier, and so while you certainly should make an effort to maintain a constant speed, what you might find is that you're going to have to just pick your data, pick the section of your data that looks like it was collected at constant speed. Let's look a little bit more at the data collection process and using the Explorer probes for this. So for this experiment, we'll be using the Explorer probe, the Explorer GLX, and the force sensor attachment. Uh, so go ahead and plug in the force sensor up at the top. Uh, it will only go in one direction, so make sure you get the right direction. And turn on your Explorer computer unit. We're going to want to adjust a few settings on this to get everything uh, working smoothly and, and collecting the data that we need. Um, when this is plugged in, by default, it'll bring up the graph menu, which is what you'll use to collect data. But we're actually going to change some settings first. So we'll hit the Home button and then go down here to the Sensors option. So you can just hit F4 to get to sensors, or you can use the arrow keys to get down there. There's only one sensor plugged in right now, but you ought to double check right here that it says force sensor, that we are adjusting settings for the force sensor. 
Uh, we're going to change the, the sample rate on this one. If you're spinning this very quickly, you might make a few revolutions per second. So if it's only taking 10, revol or 10 samples every second, you might only get a couple of data points for each revolution. That isn't really going to be enough to see the pattern that we're looking for in just a minute. So I'm going to up that to 50 samples per second. And then I know that I'm only going to be pulling on my hook. Might as well make that into a positive value. So I'm going to turn off the force push positive and instead force pull positive. I'm going to make visible. Uh, the reduce slash smooth averaging. Um, we can include that if uh, if our data looks too erratic and we're having trouble analyzing it. But on something like this, we it shouldn't actually be necessary. Uh, so we're good there. We'll hit home and go back to sensors. Oops, sorry. Home and back to the graph. So arrow down or just hit F1. And this is our um, uh, menu for collecting data. Before you collect any data, we want to zero the force sensor. So there's a button right on the front of the force sensor. Just make sure that nothing, nothing is touching the hook and that the, the unit is in the horizontal position. So we don't want the weight of the hook influencing our, our zero here either. Uh, and we'll hit zero and nothing will change. You won't see any, uh, uh, any uh, noticeable effect of hitting that, but it does calibrate the force sensor. Uh, you'll know if, if you haven't done that because you'll probably have values that jump around between positive and negative forces, which would mean sometimes it was pushing and sometimes it was pulling, and that is not going to be the case here. So I'm going to get my force sensor attached back to the end of my, my string. There we go. And then I'll hold this up against the meter stick, and I'll start some data collection um, while I'm, I'm spinning this thing. And so I'll get, uh, get an idea for what the, the data should look like here. So I'm going to start it. And now it's reading a consistent force. And I'll go ahead and start spinning it now. Oops. Now we'll start spinning it. Okay. And that ought to do it. I'll hit the play button again to stop collecting data. Now, I already know that there's only a certain section here that represents my data while I was spinning it. And I think it's going to be from about the 10 second mark to about the 15 second mark. Now, it's a little tough to read right now, so we'll adjust the scale on this. Auto scale will get us part of the way there, but even so, I have all this junk data that I want to get rid of. So I'm going to scale this even further. You have to do that manually. F2 lets you manually adjust the scale and the, uh, the position of your graph. So I'm going to hit F2, and scale shows up here. Now that scale has showed up, when I go uh, with the right arrow, when I push the right arrow, it'll zoom in in the X direction. If I do the left arrow, it'll zoom out in the X direction. So I'm going to zoom in in the uh, X direction, and then I want to shift this over a little bit, so I'll hit that F2 button again and go to Move. And now left and right will shift this graph over without adjusting the scale. So I'll get my good data somewhere in the middle, and let's zoom in just a little bit more on this so we can see the general shape here. All right, so I see you know, a little fluctuation between this part of the graph and this part. Here it looks pretty consistent. Maybe a little change there again, and then here fairly consistent. I'm going to use this data right here. That looks like my most reliable, my most consistent data. So a couple of things that I'm going to need to get from this. First off, we're using this to measure force uh, directly, but we'll also notice this very regular change where force increases and decreases. And that's going to correspond to kind of the, the flicking motion of your wrist as you're, uh, as you're twirling this thing. Uh, which actually is very convenient for us because you're going to do that one time every time the, the cork goes around one time. So I can actually use this to figure out how rapidly that cork was spinning around. So a couple of tools that you'll want to use on this. First off, to measure the force, since it's changing between a few different values there, we're going to look at the average force during that time. So to do that, we'll go to Tools and Statistics. Now this dashed line box shows up. You can adjust one side of the box to capture just a certain part of your data. So I'll adjust the, the right side over so it fits with the data I want to collect. And I'm just going to make a note here that I'm collecting data all the way through 12.12 seconds. 
And I want to be consistent in all my analysis with this. Then I want to adjust the left side of the box, so I go back to Tools and the Swap Cursors option at the very bottom. Now it lets me adjust that side. And I'll start this one at, uh, let's say, the bottom of this, so I get a few full cycles in there. So that's at 10.34 seconds. Now, it already is telling me the average during that value, the average Y value, which in this case is the force value, was 3.7 Newtons. Um, there's some other statistical values given to you, the min, the max, and the standard deviation. We're not going to worry about those for right now, though. Uh, so the average force during that time was 3.7 Newtons. I can also see that in that same time period, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six peaks in my, uh, um, in my force there, which means that that uh, cork went around six times. And I started at a low point and ended at a low point on this graph intentionally, so that's six full cycles that it goes through. Um, six full cycles, and it took the time between 10.34 seconds and 12.12 was my other time there. So I can look at how much time has changed and the fact that it went around six times so just divide that time by six, and we get the amount of time that it takes to go around that circle once. Now, why do I care how much time it takes to go around the circle once? Uh, the short answer is because it's going to be the easiest way to figure out the centripetal acceleration. Remember that that was equal to uh, v squared divided by r, but I don't know what the speed is. I don't have a way to measure the speed for this thing going around in a circle. I can, though, figure out how much distance it covers in a certain amount of time. So if I figure out the time for one cycle, I also know that in one cycle, this thing travels along a circle and gets back to its starting point. I've also measured the radius for this, so I can just find the circumference of that circle. That's the distance to go around once. We have the time to go around once. We can do distance divided by time to get the average speed, and we've got the average force. So we have everything we need to analyze uh, the, that circular motion. Um, in terms of uh, you know, Newton's second law for that, and to verify that that expression, that equation really does work over a wide range of, uh, of different values. Uh, some other experiments that you might try with this, um, extending your, your thought process here, um, maybe look at what if we don't do a horizontal circle, what if we do a vertical circle? What would we expect to change, and what do we actually see change there? How do those things compare? Uh, all, always good as, uh, experiments would be testing our assumptions. So what assumptions are we making for either case, for the horizontal circle or for the vertical circle? What assumptions are we making and uh, how good do those assumptions end up being? Um, so evaluating those things is, uh, you know, is an important part of this. Uh, so try this out, experiment a little. It takes a little technique uh, to get the, the data to be really reliable, but uh, I'm sure you'll be able to get some, some good data to draw conclusions from to uh, hopefully support that, uh, that rule that AC equals net force C divided by M. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you didn't disprove any of the physics that I know, but uh, you know, if, if it happens, then I guess we'll adapt. That's, that's science for you. Uh, so keep, keep working through that. Think about other things to try with this, uh, this apparatus and how you might extend that experiment. Um, ask questions, be curious about this, and do some science. Thanks, guys.